a discussion of life and theology from First Baptist Church in Portland, Tennessee. This is the First Word Podcast. Welcome to the First Word Podcast. I am Jacob. And I am David. This is our fifth episode, Woo-hoo. and it is a holiday special. So do we get like a t-shirt? Well, no one, uh, no one could see it. If we did, so it wouldn't really matter. This is a podcast. You could say hashtag fifth episode, (laughs) seasonal, first word. Yeah, we could get jingle bells. They could hear that. That'll work. I'm good with that. Next year. We'll get jingle bells for next year. Um, Well, we we do want to – it's not just a holiday special, but we we want to talk about the holiday. Mm. Really, um, how do we – celebrate as a church the holidays um, because as as Christians as people uh, who belong to Christ um, we don't just have a holiday really our life is um, centered around two holidays in particular um, the first coming of Jesus the first advent is the incarnation yeah. Christmas and then of course Christmas wouldn't be anything if it wasn't for Easter, so That's his resurrection. Right. Yeah, they work hand in hand. And I think the, the, the struggle we have as a church is that culture has a tendency of taking over these holidays, yeah. um, of redefining what they mean. And, and even the word holidays, you and I were talking just a minute ago, actually comes from, the, from holy days. Um, so they've even taken this word holy days, transferred it into holidays. We get all upset when someone says happy holidays. <laughs> you uh, just say, well, yes, it is. Yeah, well, absolutely <laughs> it is. And, and, but we could have a tendency not only to get caught up in what culture says we should do for Christmas, Easter, those sorts of things, how we should celebrate them. But then it, it, it also kind of gets in, we get involved in the busyness of it and we don't slow down and appreciate right. it. Right. And so the we have in a large part um, acquiesced to the secularization of the holidays. And so what are supposed to be holy days have become not. Yeah. I'm <laughs> and, still trying to figure out what acquiesce means. <laughs> give in to. <laughs> um, and, and so – how do we as a people of Christ, how do we as a church, a local church, but also the, the capital C church, uh, universal, how do we combat that? So we want to we want to talk about that, especially um, in this holiday episode. Right, it's We are in the fourth week of Advent. Yeah. Now, that's an interesting term. That's not in our normal English vernacular. So what's it mean? Advent is a Latin term that it, it comes from the Latin Adventus, mm. which literally means a coming or arrival. And so with thinking through that, we as Christians live in an in-between. We live in between two Advents. Which ones? The first coming of Jesus and the mm. second coming. So this, uh, we live in the, I, I saw this word for the first time the other day, we live in the inter-Advental period. Oh, that's another big word. But you can break it down. Absolutely. You got it. Absolutely. Uh, we live in the, just like there was an intertestamental period, the 400 yeah. years of silence between the Old and New Testament. We we live in the interadvental, the in-between two comings. Now, as the church, do we look at it that way? How, how, do, we, how do we have a tendency to look at his first coming? Um, well, I, I think we... We celebrate it. I think so. Yeah, joy to the world. I mean, um, the whole world sings hymns <laughs> yeah. Yeah. this time of year. So, in, in a sense, the the holy day of, of Christmas has crept into the secularization of the world, but vice versa as well. So we celebrate this, but what do we forget? What do we have a tendency to forget? Uh, well, we we forget a lot of times the the true meaning. And, and when we're not in church. That's right. I mean, and then his second coming. I think we talk about his second coming so often. I mean, you're in Revelation on, on Wednesday mm-hmm. night, and I think it's easy to to look at text of, about prophecy in, in Revelation and say, ah, the second coming of Christ. Right. But we in the church have focused so much on his first arrival. 
little nine pound, eight ounce baby Jesus, you know, coming, <laughs> uh, that we don't focus on the fact of he's promised to come again. Yes. And we kind of get lulled to sleep in this celebration of his first advent, and we don't focus. And so when we uh, just celebrate Christmas, say uh, Baptist churches, this is, um, it's, it has a comeback, Advent does, in Baptist churches, which I'm grateful for. Um, but this is a, it's a liturgical Mm. celebration advent is it's not a one time hey we're having a christmas eve service come to our christmas eve candlelight and our well probably don't even have a christmas service most baptist churches don't um it's different than just a christmas service it's a whole season of preparation a whole season of waiting Mm -hmm. a whole season of contemplation of thinking not just about the first advent when you even use that word it it forces you to think of of coming and arrival and it forces you to think of the second advent and you know i want you to go more detail about the liturgical aspect of this because you mentioned a word just then about how we as the church um, should be in a, a, a an attitude of waiting now as we've grown older, I think our kids have that down pat. Like the whole month of December is just constant waiting. We as adults don't really focus on that. We don't have that anticipation um, that we used to. I mean, as I've gotten older, I have less anticipation, right? But the liturgical calendar was written in such a way that your whole life revolved, not just through the month of December, around the understanding of who Christ is and the liturgy. So the liturgical calendar, this is the the Christian church calendar, It prominent in Catholic churches still, uh, prominent in what's called high church settings. Uh, a lot of most Protestants, Baptists, are traditionally what's called low church, more casual, more uh, less structured. Um, high church is... Um, you have all these rituals, these these liturgies, um, reciting of these same things every week over and over and over. Um, but, you know, so I've grown up Southern Baptist my whole life, and you, you see a lot of people coming, I don't want to say coming out of low church to high church, but a people from a low church setting longing for some of these aspects of liturgy because there's a richness, there's a depth, there's a, a intention and purposefulness within those that that you lose uh, when you don't have them as a part of your your normal worship okay and so the the cycle the liturgical cycle of the Christian year is all centered around two core events two core celebrations and it is um, the first coming is it's Christmas so that's the advent season and then it's also the uh, Easter season, so the the death and resurrection of Jesus, and all in between. There's some ordinary time that is said, um, but we live our whole life is centered around those two seasons. And so, whenever you center a church, even on the liturgical calendar, it forces you to think through the grand redemptive narrative of of Scripture how it applies to our life, but it also ties us back to a rich, deep, long history of of tradition of believers, mm-hmm. of followers of Christ um, that's not just here and now. We have – C.S. Lewis coined a term. I think he coined it. He at least talked about it called chronological snobbery. Yeah. And we have a – we tend to think we are so far advanced from – uh, the people of 200 years ago, let, let alone 2,000, um, but but that's not true, um, and we lose so much when we don't think on the people of the past mm. that is in church history, but also the people of the Bible. Um, thinking through Advent connects us with the shepherds on the hillside. Mm. It connects us with uh, Mary and Joseph in a way uh, we we read the Bible at Christmas time in a little different way than we read the Bible throughout the year. I think, and we we put ourselves a little bit within that story, uh, and I, I think we should read the Bible more so yeah. that way. Um, but the slowing down of the Advent season um, allows us to to do this with more intention. And, and I think that's that's extremely key. And, and, and you're talking about slowing us down to read what scripture says, to 
to soak in what Scripture says. I mean, most of the time, I believe, we're more concerned about if the pastor goes over 30 minutes on a sermon, right? <laughs> or we learn our, our um, Christmas story through a nativity scene we may put up in our house um, every season. Um, and, and we learn more from those aspects rather than slowing down and seeing what Scripture actually says. About Absolutely. And so we think about learning and growing in knowledge and understanding in terms of just just teaching, in terms of talking, reading. Um, but there, there are more ways that we learn um, than just that. We learn through liturgy, okay? Now, liturgy isn't just reciting of the Apostles' Creed together. That, that is a liturgy. Mm-hmm. Liturgies are practices we do um, on a normal basis over and over, okay? Sure. Um, so there's a prominent uh, theologian um, named James K. A. Smith. Uh, his popular book is called Desiring the Kingdom. And it talks about how we learn uh, in all of life through different liturgies. There's secular liturgies we are trained by and train our kids in that they are going to have a very hard time breaking when they're old. It's Absolutely. liturgy. It's liturgy over and over and over. What you practice, what you don't practice is teaching people something. And so liturgies of the church matter, seasons of, of life. James K. Smith um, defines liturgy. He says, uh, the liturgy is a hearts and minds strategy, a pedagogy. Pedagogy is a form of teaching that trains us as disciples precisely by putting our bodies through a regimen of repeated practices that get hold of our heart and aim our love toward the kingdom of God. Wow. And so this is how we should, uh, we should practice um, a, a constant, um, I'll just say we should have more tradition. <laughs> yeah. In our low church, Baptist church, uh, we lose a lot of Christian meaning and discipleship by not practicing liturgy. And I want you to hear what he says. Uh, Later on in his book, in page 157, he talks about the season of Advent and even Lent and different aspects of, of the Easter celebration. But, but I want us to hear what he says here. It's profound. He says, during Advent each year, the Christian year teaches us once again uh, to once again become Israel, recognizing our sin and need, thus waiting, longing, hoping, calling, praying for the coming of the Messiah the advent of justice, and the inbreaking of shalom. We go through the ritual of desiring the kingdom, a kind of holy impatience, by reenacting Israel's longing for the coming of the king. The repetition of this year after year is a training and expectation. And, and he says we get that whenever we practice continually the, the Eucharist, the Lord's Supper, when we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Mm. So that goes back, even in the Lord's Supper, we hadn't talked about that, but... No. That's uh, looking forward and hopeful expectation of the second advent. Because uh, let's just add on to that. To his disciples, what it was the promise or what was his hope that he would, Christ would then take with the, uh, the supper with his disciples when he comes again. Yeah, yeah. You know, in at the, the marriage supper of the Lamb. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, he, he goes on to say, thus advent shakes us out of the present complacency that we can be lulled into. Instead, we're called and formed to be a people of expectancy, looking for the coming again of the Messiah. Um, And he goes on, now listen to this. He says, at the same time, the rhythms of Christian worship in the liturgical year, it stretches us backwards. They're practices of remembering. Mm. Another habit that we learn from Israel, we remember with gratitude God's act of redemption in the Exodus, Psalm 78, and the cross. Lent and Easter invite us backward to remember the power unleashed in the cross and resurrection, a power that continues to break into the present, Philippians 3, 10, and 11. The Christian year, he says, itself is an ancient inheritance reminding us that we are part of a people that is older than our present, that we are heirs of tradition. I love that. Mm -hmm. Thus, we're constituted as a people who live between times, remembering and hoping at the same time. Each week, this betweenness is performed in the Eucharist, the Lord's Supper, which both invites us to do this in remembrance of be, and by so doing, to proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And then finally, he says this. It's profound. He says, we are a stretched people, 
citizens of a kingdom that is both older and newer than anything offered by the contemporary. The practices of Christian worship over the liturgical year form in us something of an old soul that is perpetually pointed to a future, longing for a coming kingdom, and seeking to be such a stretched people in the present who are a foretaste of the coming kingdom. Oh, man. You know, it, it, you're, you're talking about that. I'm thinking about our culture where we can't, if we have to sit in the doctor's office for any amount of time, then it's taken forever for that to happen. We don't like to wait. No, microwaves. Yeah. You know, you have all these different things. But do we see a picture of waiting in the Old Testament? Oh, constantly. Absolutely. Constantly. You preach the first week of Advent on Genesis three fifteen, how God promised that um, he would send a Messiah, basically, is yeah. what he was referring to, who would um, crush the serpent's head in that. Mm-hmm. And so from that point on, from Eve on, that account's been passed on and you go through Abraham, the covenant. Just promise after promise after promise, covenant um, after, after covenant. Yeah. And it, then waiting after waiting. Absolutely. Yeah. And you think about the amount of time. And, and I mean, even like you take Isaiah, I mean, 700 years between Isaiah and Jesus coming on the scene to going in the synagogue saying, this is fulfilled right now. Absolutely. And, yeah. and, and we don't need to get into young earth, old earth conversations right now. But you think from the time of creation, Genesis, Adam and Eve, that conversation happened all the way through the Old Testament. Yeah. You hold that section, just the Old Testament in between your fingers and say, they waited. Yeah. And they waited and waited mm-hmm. and waited and waited and waited. Prophets came. God continued to speak through, to um, his people through his prophets. And then Christ came. And Christ that was came. the first Christ came. That was the fulfillment of the promise. Yeah. Now, how long have we waited? A long time. Yeah. I mean, we're looking at 2,000 plus years, and we're waiting. And, and, and I don't know, and I, I should, shouldn't even state this, but you know, I think it's in Peter where he says scoffers will scoff and say Christ didn't come back yesterday yeah. and yeah. he didn't come back today. And mm-hmm. I really do believe, honestly, and I hate to say this, that it becomes more of our mindset that he's coming, but we just become complacent and we, we don't wait We don't well. live with the expect, expectation. We don't live with the, the urgency. We don't live with the, a sense of imminence of his return. Mm. Yeah. To the point that sometimes when someone comes on the scene and they said, I've done the work, I've done the mathematics, Christ is going to come back on this date, <laughs> all of a sudden everybody changes. Yeah. You know, they change their lifestyle, they, 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 they go to church more often, you know, all these different things. We've seen it in the past, and then, and then nothing happens. Yeah. So. And so when we focus on Advent, it, it forces us to think back. It, as James K. Smith, I mean, we, we become Israel in a sense in our mind. Mm. And it forces us to remember that that God is there in the waiting. So give us some ways that we have to wait well, to celebrate well. And I'm not talking just Advent because we're we're in the last week of Advent, yeah. right? Um, so give us some ways that we can look at how we can celebrate Advent well. We're, we're going to celebrate Christmas around the corner. Um, Easter is shortly thereafter. So what are ways that we as the church can wait well. Well, I don't want to say just the church, but I I think of individual families Mm -hmm. within the homes. Uh, We do it a little more in the church than we do in our homes, to Mm -hmm. be honest. Um, We are more likely to put up a picture of Santa on our walls Mm -hmm. um, than we are to discuss the nativity with our children or to work through an Advent devotional with our family. Um, and so that's where to start. I mean, break open the scriptures with your family. This is a liturgy of, of life where we come back around to December and we are, as a family, discussing Luke 2 mm. and John 1 and Isaiah uh, again for the 10th year in a row, <laughs> you know, and but that does something deep within you. Um, and so maybe if, if you're a listener and you haven't started something like that, start that pattern with your family. But as a church, um, our intentionality, uh, we at Advent, we do a little more high church than what we're used to. We have a purposeful lighting of candles 
that commemorate uh, – there's three – um, purple ones, one pink one, and one white one. Mm-hmm. You, and they signify different meanings, hope, love, joy, peace, and then the Christ candle. Mm-hmm. And so we have purposeful scripture readings, people giving testimonies about those specific topics, and then the lighting of a candle. Um, Walk us through that real quick uh, on lighting the candles because there are five candles on there. Yeah. Sometimes we have four weeks in Advent. Sometimes we have five. Right. Well, the the middle one, the the white one, is the Christ candle, mm-hmm. so that signifies His birth. He's here. Um, the others signify a, a lot, just a hopeful expectation. Even though they're not all the hope candle, there's a hopeful expectation, a looking back on prophecies and seeing how they're fulfilled. Um, and so you light that Christ candle to on Christmas or to to signify His His arrival. Um, but, you know, we don't light candles in our low church Southern Baptist setting. They right. do in, in high church settings, but, you know, it's welcomed, and it's different, and it's a slowing down, um, and it's purposeful and intentional, um, and it makes us, our hearts and our minds perk up a little more, like, oh, this is different, and and that's a good thing. You know, one thing we tried to do this year, we're, we're going to have more of an emphasis in 2024 on family discipleship, and we're calling it Foundations. Um, some of our classes, not all, we didn't introduce this to the church as a whole, um, but we started coming up with more family guides for Advent um, to be presented in some of our classes so that they could spend one time during the week going over what that Advent season. The first week was all about waiting, waiting well. You know, make a promise to your children. Yeah. See how often, you know, see how excited they get about this promise. Um, and then week two is when you initiate the promise. Not to forget about it, but to do it. Um, but we do that as, as a way to introduce. Um, next year, we'll have more information on there. We'll, we'll, we'll make that open to the church yeah. as a whole. We released to, to families a uh, Advent devotional book by Marty Machowski called mm-hmm. – um, prepare him room. It goes. Absolutely. It's in conjunction with Sovereign Grace Music's Christmas album, Prepare Him Room, and it's just another way to slow down and be intentional in in families this time of year. Absolutely, and and, and so there's another verse I want to to read to you. Um, it's it's t- in Titus um, because some people will say, "Well, is Advent even biblical?" You know, we're talking about a liturgical calendar. We're talking about. Uh, taking the time, but is, is there a scripture? And, and absolutely there is. And I want to direct you to uh, Titus 2, verses 11 through 14. And it says this, this is from the ESV, for the grace of God has appeared. That's his first advent. Bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passion and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. Verse 13, waiting so we hear this word waiting again. For our blessed hope, the appearance of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. That's Titus 2, 11 through 14. So it talks about his first advent and then this waiting of a blessed hope of his second advent. Yep. And as we think back on his first advent, you know, he came. He came. And and though we're waiting, 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 because he came, we can rest assured with confident hope uh, that he is coming again. And you know, we've talked about this um, privately. It's interesting. On his, not necessarily, we haven't talked in the context of his first advent, but they knew the Old Testament, the, the, they knew, they knew the scriptures. Mm-hmm. They knew what the, how the Messiah would come. They knew the prophecies. Yeah, they were looking for him. They, they were, were they were waiting. They were quote unquote looking, right? right. You know, right. but then they when had he the came, scriptures open. They yes, had, yeah. and then when he came, it was it was just a great surprise. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, a good way to put it. Yeah, it was a great surprise, um, and and that's for a people who've been waiting. Yeah, who who put their position, their future, their hopes. In the Messiah coming, um, it was a little misguided what they thought the Messiah was going to be, but they were waiting and they were called unaware. Yeah, this is a good reminder for us as the church mm-hmm. that not only should we be preparing, but not to be called unaware. Yeah, what 
What are you waiting for? That's a good question to ask. Um, what are you prepared for? What are you preparing for? What are you um, practicing? Yeah. What are your liturgies of life? Yeah. What are you teaching your kids by your daily, weekly, monthly, yearly habits? And just look at the last 30 days. Yeah. What have we taught our family is important about Christmas? Yeah. Um, what do they see us do? How do they see us talk? Um, what's truly important? What are the liturgies that we're teaching them right now? Is yeah. it the liturgy that culture says is important this time of the year? Or are we focused on what Scripture says? Now, I'm preaching to myself yeah. as much as I am to anyone else right now because I know what my actions have taught. Yeah. But this is this is why we, as a Southern Baptist, low church setting, why we practice Advent mm. um, is for these very reasons. We We need this. We need to wait with patient endurance and hopeful expectation because he is coming back. Amen. So thank you for tuning in to this special Advent episode of the First Word Podcast. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas.